Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this evening's webinar. My name is Mike Stellick and I am the Director of Alumni Engagement here at Doan University. Um, our goals in the Doan Alumni Office are always to educate, engage, and empower our alumni, students, employees, and friends. We're excited to have you join us for part two of this incredibly timely webinar, which will be recorded and shared with the Doan community after we're done tonight. If you missed our first webinar on this topic, that's completely okay, but if you're curious and wanna watch it, be sure to head over to our alumni Facebook page and or YouTube page, and you can watch that there. If you have any questions for our panelists throughout the presentation, please go ahead and type those into the question and answer box, which is located in the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll be having time throughout the whole session to answer those questions, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, tonight's webinar will once again focus on the Ukrainian crisis, a topic which has remained at the top of so many of our minds lately. Um, we're lucky to once again have former Doan professor Dr. William Gleason as our featured guest tonight. We're also pleased to have Dr. Mark, Dr. Mark Orsag, sorry about that. Um, he's our professor of history at Doan, and we also have Doan's very own Marty Fye to help facilitate the conversation. Um, I will give a quick brief introduction of Marty Fye, and I'll turn it over to him in a bit. Uh, Marty is a 1983 graduate from Doan. He currently serves as the Vice President of Advancement, and he also oversees the likes of admission, enrollment, financial aid, marketing. Um, he's a busy guy here at Doan. Um, this follow-up webinar came together quickly once again, thanks to the motivation and drive that Marty has, and I just want to thank him for that. Uh, Marty, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks, Mike. And as you said, we're excited to welcome Dr. Mark Orsag with us this evening. One of, the, one of the things that's interesting is Mark followed Dr. Gleason to Doan. So Mark's, Mark's a lifer. Um, some of you uh, on there will recognize him from your years here at Doan coming in 1998. But Mark holds the title of Professor of European and Inter Interdisciplinary History at Doan. He received his bachelor's degree from Carnegie Mellon and, uh, and as well as his master's from Pennsylvania State University and his doctorate in European history from Michigan State. Both uh, uh, Dr. Orsag and Bill share a mentor or friends from his uh, mentor at Michigan State. So they've known each other for many years, Dr. Gleason and, and his mentor. In addition to two European history survey courses, Dr. Orsag teaches upper division courses in Roman, Russian, British, French, and German interdisciplinary and military history as a scholar. Dr. Orsag has over 30 academic publications and presentations. An impressive fact about Mark is in his time at Doan since 1998, he's received the Teacher of the Year Award from Student Congress not one time, three, three times. Um, so uh, he's one of the student's favorite professors. Lastly, it's my pleasure to welcome again uh, my friend, Dr. Bill Gleason. Um, I, I've known him since he arrived at Doan. I was a student uh, when, when he came and, um, and happened to return to the university in 1995, just before he left. So um, it's, been, it's been interesting visiting with you, Dr. Gleason, and I'm gonna kind of turn it over to you to kind of take us from where we ended last Thursday to what's going on now uh, at this point in your mind in the Ukraine. Well, thank you, Marty. It's good to see you, and it's good to have you here. And and Mark, thank you for. Um, I'm sorry, not not Mark, but but um, yeah, Mark. I've got it right, Mark. And then there's Mike, and then there's Marty. I'll tell you, if your last, if you don't have a last name that begins with M, you're in real trouble. You know, in this group, this is this is obviously the M group that we're talking about tonight. It's good to be here this evening. Although I have to say that I wish it were under far happier circumstances, because I'm sure you'll agree with me that what we're witnessing now in Ukraine, in Ukraine is a tragedy, a tragedy of the of deep dimensions. Uh, just before coming over here, to, I'm sorry, not coming over here, but just before sitting down tonight to kind of put a few thoughts together, I got an email from a former colleague of mine, a friend at uh, Indon at Kiev, in, in Kiev his name is Mihailo Kirsenko. Mihailo Kirsenko is really was really my closest friend in Ukraine while I was living and working there in the 1990s. 
Uh, we corresponded a great deal since then. Um, in fact, I helped Mihailo get a, get a Fulbright to the United States. Mihailo is a brilliant man. He speaks seven or eight languages all fluently. And he was really the man who kind of kept track of me while I was wandering around Kiev trying to figure out where I was half the time. Just today, I received an email from Kirsenko, who is now about, oh, I'm guessing about 75 years old. And in that email, he said the following. I don't have it with me, but I, I, I read it enough this afternoon that I almost broke down at one point. Mihailo said, you know, these are his words. You know, Bill, I've never fired a gun before. I've never shot anybody before. And I don't plan to right now. But if I have to, if it's necessary, these are his words, I will do it. I will do it. And that brought home to me the full realization of just how deep this reaction is going now amongst the Ukrainian population. If there's, there are so many things that I could say about this war so far, but let me just start by making a couple points. So far, at least from what we can tell, and I realize that you know, a lot is happening even as we sit here and speak tonight, even as, if we, as we sit here and talk about this, a great deal is happening. But the first impression that I have is that almost nobody saw what was happening and saw, in other words, mo most people, including yours truly, I'll confess I'm just as guilty as the next guy, but most of us thought that this war would be over in a matter of days. It's not a matter of days, and, and it's, it's a matter of weeks already. We also believed, and again, here I'm putting myself right in the middle of the discussion. We also believed a week ago, eight days ago, that the Ukrainians were so hopelessly outnumbered, you know, equipment wise, weapons wise, you know, that they could barely put up a fight. I was wrong. Not only are the Ukrainians putting up a fight, they're putting up a really good fight, you know, and those pictures that are coming in now via CNN, via, via MSNBC, you know, where the Ukrainians are shown running around in the streets, all of the men of Ukraine seem to be fighting at the same time. This is a remarkable, remarkable story. The other story, however, that I, I think is equally remarkable, you know, and maybe, maybe Mark would like to throw, throw one or two words in here since he's a Russian specialist as well, is the reaction so far at least of the many Russian people. You have these pictures of crowds in downtown Moscow, in the center of Moscow, not far from the Kremlin, which is where the, the government has its headquarters. It's where Putin lives in, in, in you know, at, well, he doesn't live, live there, but, but he spends most of his free time there. What strikes me is that many, many Russians have a lot of questions about what the hell is happening here. No one was told anything about what this war was going, you know, what, have, what are we doing here? People are asking, why are we fighting this war? What's going on? Tell us something. This is the, the answer that we're getting over and over and over, both from the Ukrainian people on the Ukrainian side and the, from the Russian people on the Russian side. In other words, what we seem to have on our hands is a war that nobody understands, nobody has explained, nobody knows what the hell is going on, and no one certainly knows how it's going to turn out. If someone were to come along and tell me how this war is going to go, I think I would either leave the room, you know, because I don't want to be, you know, rude and crude to this person, or just say, how do you know? And I don't think I would get much of an answer. I think the most important thing to remember so far, other than the violence, other than the sadness of watching children get killed, and they had many pictures on television today of children, you know, running down the street, trying to stay up with their mothers, um, you had pictures of mothers carrying little babies to the train station to get on, to get out of the country. Almost 700,000 Ukrainians have now left Ukraine to go you know, into neighboring states where they have a, a, a chance to at least survive. 
So I'm just going to stop at this point because I want to make the first point that I want to make, maybe, uh, maybe Mark would like to throw his, his reaction in here too. And that is that this is a war that no one seems to understand or uh, other than Putin himself. And it's not even clear to me that he knows what he's doing. This is a strange, strange moment in time. Yeah, I, I think that the the and I, I'll, I'll try to give what I what I would assume to be the Russian perspective um, on on this. Obviously, there seem to have been two motivations, and and Bill, you can kind of um, answer this as well and, and see what you think of this. There seem to be two broader motivations. Which one was this idea of we don't want Ukraine in in NATO, right? That was the one thing. And then the second thing seemed to be an idea of trying to restore some kind of sphere of influence that would sort of push back Western influence from, from Russia's borders. Uh, obviously, the first thing you, you could argue could have waited, right? I mean, it, it wasn't a, a super pressing issue uh, at this moment um, that it was probably five, six years down the road. And so the thing that mystifies me about this uh, whole thing is that why now? I, I just, I, I don't get it um, at all. And I missed the start of this. I felt that, yeah, he's going to pressure. And then if he doesn't want what, get what he wants on NATO, he'll recognize the two separatist areas, call it good, and move everybody back to barracks. Yeah, why, that, well, I think why, you're I think you're making a good point, Mark. Let me say one thing very quickly. It's see, what strikes me about the conversation so far among the so-called experts about this war and what's going on is the fact that more and more the conversation is, set, is, is starting to settle on the point about Putin's mentality and how he thinks and acts and behaves. And more and more people are starting to say something that even a few days ago would have, would have been kind of questioned or rendered incomprehensible, but no longer. I was struck in, in coming you know, into, into our discussion tonight. I tried to do as much background checking as possible. I'm really struck by how many people seem to be saying something like this. Something is wrong with Putin. Something is off. Just the way he behaves as he walks around, the fact that he sits at these tables that, you know, that, that go on forever, you know, and he does it with his closest you know, advisors and, and, and people, in other words, with whom he should have good relations. You know, that's one thing. Of course, we know we know something else about Putin. We don't have to guess at this. And that is that for the last, oh, what am I trying to say here? That for the last several years, Putin has been increasingly isolated, you know, within, the, within his own government. He is more or less, I don't even know, even know where he is. You know, he's hiding out. He's somewhere else. He's just kind of off in his dacha near Sochi, you know, and, and that's about it. So what strikes me as important here, I mean, why do I even mention this? If you have a man who is mentally unbalanced, a man who is mentally off, a man who is seriously troubled, you know, psychologically and internally, and you also have a man with his finger on the nuclear button, and he's already, yeah. already said more than once that he's put to his, his I don't know how, what, the, what the term is here, the, the high alert for, forces you know, on, on standby alert, including the, and he even said, including my nuclear forces. So it strikes me that what we have here is a man who is increasingly unbalanced. I'm trying to find the right word here, Mark. He's increasingly unbalanced. He doesn't seem to know what he's doing half the time. In fact, you know, I mean, there is no reason for, because as you said, Putin could have gotten everything he says he wanted without a war. He probably could have gotten this out of the Ukraine, out of the Ukrainian forces, out of the Ukrainian government. So the whole thing, and by thing, I mean war, takes on a kind of surreal quality. Yeah, I, I, would, I would kind of agree with that uh, um, mostly. Um, I think he, the, the whole impression, and, and we'll, we'll see what you think, the whole impression of him in the last several months, it's like a different guy, 
it, it, yeah. you, know, you look and because he's been so shrewd over the years, he's been so effective. He's given the military very defined tasks. He won every war he's been in. And now he gives them this really huge, very undefined task for reasons that don't seem immediate. Like you, you, you don't know why he has chosen to do this at this point. It just seems very counterproductive. And back to your point of on what happens here, I too, it's like, who knows? Um, even if he prevails in the end, um, this seems like an inc- just a crazy risky thing to do for no immediately compelling reason that I can understand. Yeah, well, I think you're making a good point here. Let me let me just stretch it out a little bit. That is that what you're what we're beginning to see very clearly is what an occupation of Ukraine w- would really be like. You know, the Ukrainians have not are not only fighting well. I mean, they're doing pretty good on you know running around with Molotov cocktails, you know, with with rifles that have been given them, you know, by the by the authorities. You know, even if you've never shot a gun before, you're running down the street with your gun and your Molotov cocktail. You know, in fact, there is a story about some some um, Ukrainians on an island down near Odessa, and I've been to this place before, who were, and, and there was this battleship coming along, and the sailors on the battleship wanted the, the Ukrainians on this island to basically surrender. You know, and the Ukrainians on the island said, F you. You know, and, and they all stood on the edge, on the edge of the land and basically swore their heads off at the Russians and they're still alive. I mean, what, what we're looking at now are people who are in one degree or another completely flummoxed with what, what is happening. Ukrainians don't know what to think, don't know what to believe. They only know that a lot of them are being killed right out, right on the spot, you know, and you Russians, I mean, we've had stories of Russian tanks that are out of gas, that are out of equipment, that are, are stuck on the road, that are trying to get back to Russia. There was a story yesterday, which I thought was rather both rather telling and rather amusing. And that is if there was a tank, a Russian tank, somewhere near, somewhere down in southeastern Ukraine. Um, and it, it pulled up in a neighborhood and, and some, some Russian soldiers got out of the tank and asked some people who were walking along the street where the hell they were. And when they were told where the hell they were, they climbed back in the tank and said, we're going back to Russia. Now tell me that this is an army that's ready to run an occupation. Tell me. And I can't for the life of me begin to imagine what an occupation of, of Ukraine would be like under the Russians, at least at this point, you know, I find it, I, I really struggle to find, find words to describe what I'm thinking or feeling or what I, I think might, might happen. Now, I grant you that the militarily, things are probably still on the side of the Russians simply because they have so many tanks, so many soldiers, so many, you know, killing equipment, so much killing equipment. But even there, I begin to wonder, well, maybe if all the tanks run out of gas, you know, they won't be able to go anywhere. Maybe the tanks have no idea where they're going to begin with. In other words, the whole thing seems to break down. You know, and again, let's go back to the, to the point that we're making about the Russian objective you know, in Ukraine. What is the Russian objective? To, to decapitate the Ukrainian government and they, they want to find Zelensky. And I want to say a thing or two about the Ukrainian president, who, in my opinion, of all the people involved in this war, he emerges as probably the most interesting and the most telling and, the, and probably my, the hero of the hour you know, in Ukraine, Zelensky, the Ukrainian president. You know, but so I guess what I'm trying to say here is that no matter where you go in Ukraine today, you find people who are simply confused, flummoxed. They have no idea what's going to happen next. And what that tells me, Mark, is that anything could happen next. Anything. I want to go ahead and, and read a couple questions from the chat, Bill. And uh, um, I've, some of these we've already kind of covered. Okay. Um, so uh, there's a question about uh, children with disabilities. 
Um, and uh, the, the, question, the question here is, um, does Putin have a Hitler-esque view of disabled children and people? Yeah, that's a good question, but unfortunately I can't answer it because I just don't know. Um, they, you know, there are hospitals, there are care facilities in, in Ukraine. Ukraine is, is a modern country in, uh, in that sense. Um, but I don't know about disabled children. If they, if they have facilities for that particular issue or that particular problem, I'm sorry. And then there's another one here, Bill. Um, are, are we heading toward another Cold War? And, and once you're done, I'd like to jump in on that one as well. Sure. I think we're not only heading for another Cold War, I think we're in another Cold War. I don't think there's any question that, I mean, look what we're talking about here. Thousands have been killed. Tens of thousands have fled the country. I mean, Ukraine is a total mess. You know, buildings, buildings have been blown up no matter where you look. The, the fighting tonight, even as we sit here and discuss it, is horrendous, according to everything that I've seen. The Russians are advancing on Kiev, you know, and they'll probably destroy it if they have any chance at all, unless there's an uprising, you know, of the Russian population against Putin, you know, against the Russian leadership. That's the one thing that I kind of hold out, but not too high above my head, that I hold out as a possible, I don't quite know how to, how to say it, as a possible out you know, for these people. Yeah, um, a Cold War, I, I would say, yeah, we're in it already. Um, I would say we've probably been in it with, and you can talk about a Cold War with China too, obviously, but sure. um, a Cold War with Russia probably since 2008, um, yes. when yes. Uh, you had the United States recognize Kosovo and then Russia uh, invade Georgia, which I think were two very linked. Um, well, and let's, let's not forget, let's not forget Crimea, you know, and the Donbass too, because in that 2014, happened in 2014. Right, yeah. 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 And by, the way, by the way, I was in Kiev during the Maidan, during the uprising okay. in, in 2014. I mean, I was actually there in connection with my work at the State Department. Um, and I stood in a crowd of a million people in downtown Kiev who were calling for the ouster of Viktor Yanukovych, who was the pro-Russian stooge who, who tried to run the country for a couple of years and then ran away and is now living in Moscow somewhere. Uh, and then there's another one here, Bill. Um, consensus seems to be that an occupation of Ukraine is not feasible. Assuming that the Ukrainian government does fall, are there any groups within Ukraine who might be so inclined as to cooperate with Russia in the formation of a new government? I'm sorry, the, read the end of that question again. Uh, are there, ass, assuming that the Ukrainian government does fall, are there any groups within Ukraine who might be so inclined as to cooperate with Russia in the formation of a new government? Yeah, and, and the answer to that question is yes, there are groups in Ukraine who would be willing to cooperate with a pro-Russian government. Let's remember you know, that there were people in Ukraine before all this happened, there were people in Ukraine, particularly in Eastern Ukraine, over by the Donbass, who were kind of pro-Putin, pro-Russia. I don't mean that they were ready to go out and fight, you know, but they, their political values were conservative, almost Soviet-like you know, in certain ways. And in fact, the Donbass has long, had a reputation in Ukraine as being the most conservative pro-Soviet group in the country. And I used to go down there a lot because one of the things that I, I did, and I don't know if I ever told you about this, Mark, but one of the things that I did, I was the director of the Fulbright program for Ukraine there for about six years. And so I'd go running around the country trying to find people who were interested in applying for a Fulbright. And one of the places I used to go was the Donbass. I used to go down to Donetsk. I never got over to Luhansk, which is way over, mm -hmm. you know, Eastern Ukraine, you know. But I, I, so I would go down to this part of Ukraine and I would have conversations with people sitting in deans, with deans sitting in their office with a picture of Lenin, you know, up on the, on the ceiling somewhere. And I start, after a while, I started to ask myself, what are these people trying to tell me? What are they trying to say? Are they trying to say that the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, you know, was 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 stupid and and fraudulent and so forth? Of course, that's what Putin believed. 
you know, at the time. So there are people, I'm running away from the question here, but let me, so let me summarize. There are people in Ukraine who will, I think, be available for help with a pro-Russia group. Yes. Yeah, I would, I would tend to concur with that. And I think you can kind of see this reflected a little bit in the way that the war is going. Yes. Uh, the, the war is going better for Ukraine where you think it would be, which is up north. And the war is going much better for Ru Russia where you think it would be, would be, which would be down south. And that sort of, there's a, there's a kind of line that runs through it. You know, the, the northwest is very, very, very anti-Russian, pro-Ukrainian, pro-Western. The, the more southeast you go, the more pro-Russian you get. Yeah, again, I, I had all of these little experiences. You know, it's Ukraine is a big country with a lot of different groups and a lot of different people, and they're kind of all over the place. But one thing needs to be said here, Mark, and I maybe I should have made this point a little earlier. The one thing that Putin has done for Ukraine is to unite mm -hmm. most Ukrainians against him and against the Russian government. So I have to kind of qualify what I just said in my answer to the other question, there may be groups in Ukraine who are willing to work with the Russians in forming a new government, but there aren't a lot. And the, and the group is getting smaller by the day. Um, let me see here. Um, who, there's, one, there's another one here that we talked about already. Um, who is in place to replace Putin? If I guess it, the, the, the implication is if Putin is somehow ousted, uh, and how could that happen? Boy, that's a good question. I wish yeah. I had some answer to give you. I'm afraid I don't. You know, his, his sidekick, he used to be the president of Ukraine for a year or two, Medvedev. Okay, remember him? You know, he met, met with, uh, 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 well, okay, I'm trying to remember who, who he met with, but, and he speaks good English, he's smart, he probably, he has some experience in government, I don't know if the Putin group groups would ever accept him as the new leader. It's hard to say. I don't have any other names to, to give you. Uh, one of the things that Putin has done is to, is to get rid of anybody and everybody who, you know, who, who upsets him, which is just about everybody in the end. I mean, Putin really is isolated now, psychologically and politically. So. I have no idea who might come along and replace him and or step step into his shoes or do something like that. I just don't. Yeah, I, I'll jump in on that one. I, I think, again, he's unlikely to get replaced, I think, um, unless this just goes really, really, really badly. Um, you could possibly see a general stepping in. You could possibly see an oligarch stepping in. Um, uh, Dmitry Medvedev might might be the guy you talk about. Bill would be maybe, in a certain sense, the logical successor. But I don't think he's respected within the Russian political elite. He's seen as too weak. Right. So um, my guess it would be be maybe a general or or one of the oligarchs. But I, I do think we're we're a long long way from that. Uh, happening at this point. Um, yeah, and the other thing to be said here, which is what I just said, one of the, the aspects of Putin's rule has been the elimination of anybody and everybody who posed any real threat to him or any alternative to him even. So he really has pushed Medvedev into the shadows. I, I noticed that the other day that Medvedev was sitting around the council table, you know, and he wasn't moving, he wasn't looking right or left. And I thought, Boy, here was a man who came pretty close to replacing Putin a couple of years ago, and he was out of it, Medvedev. Uh, the couple of questions that I'll kind of combine here. Um, so, uh, what is the um, what are the chances, Bill, that you think that Zelensky's emergency application to become a member of the EU? Uh, what are the chances of that being accepted? Boy, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. Um, I'd like to say that there's there's more than a decent chance that something like this could happen. What what really interests me in all of this so far, I mean, a, a lot of things interest me, but the other day, or maybe it was even yesterday, correct me if I'm wrong here, that uh, 
Zelensky gave a talk to the European Parliament. Did you see that? He gave a talk to the European Parliament and he spoke in several languages, actually. He spoke in U Ukrainian, you know, and then he switched over to English for a few minutes and then he went back to Ukrainian. And when the talk was over, the entire auditorium rose as one to offer their applause. applause. Now, why am I saying this? What's the importance, I think, of this particular event? I am saying this because Zelensky now is rapidly gaining in, in a following. He's almost, he's almost like he's in a, his own little world. Um, I, I don't know how this guy has managed to do this so far. He's somewhere in Kiev. People don't seem to know exactly where he is. I noticed that one of the CNN reporters you know, interviewed him today. And I thought, boy, I hope that guy is, is being careful here because if the Russians find out where the CNN reporter is, there goes Zelensky. You know, so I, I just, you know, the whole situation is so confusing now and so fast moving. I mean, before we get out of here tonight, for all I know, Kiev has been taken. I mean, Kiev is, 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 is captured. The entire city is blown up. I mean, this could happen. I don't think it will. Not yet, at least, but because Ukrainians continue to fight with a ferocity that is simply breathtaking, simply breathtaking. Uh, how another one, Bill? Um, how can I, as an average American, make a difference? Well, you can. There are different organizations that are trying to collect money. You know, you can give a donation to one of these organizations. You can. Um, you can even send food, you can send clothes, you know, they've got all kinds of, of things going in there now. I mean, Ukraine is being overwhelmed with donations. I mean, they're just everywhere you look, people are giving, you know, the best they can. So I think if you want to do something like that, you know, I, I would either contact the Red Cross, I would say I'd go after the Red Cross. You know, I, I don't know where else you might go. I should should have thought about this a little more before coming in here this evening, but Ukraine needs everything. They, I mean, they need weapons, they need ammunition, they need food, they need clothing, they need housing, they need people to come there. I mean, if I were a younger man, I'd be on the train tonight, seriously, you know. So, you know, it's going to be important that the Ukraine Ukrainians feel that the rest of the world cares about them. And I think the rest of the world does care about Ukraine. Uh, does the Ukraine military not have any air power to take out the 40 mile long convoy of Russian troops heading to Kiev? And I, I have an answer on this too, Bill, but I'll, I'll let you start it. Well, the, so far, unless, unless, <laughs> unless Biden made a point in his State of the Union address that I haven't heard and I don't know anything about, you know, but as you know, we have refused to, there is pressure out there from some people in our country to enforce the no-fly zone, all right? If you do that, and then, in other words, you have a no-fly zone, if that happens, and we try to institute a no-fly zone, and then a Russian jet comes along, and we shoot it down to honor the no-fly zone, that's probably World War III. Yeah. That's probably World War III. I hate to hate to talk like mm -hmm. that because it sounds apocalyptic, but I don't think I'm being apocalyptic at all. You know, and I think that explains the refusal of Biden to go along with this kind of suggestion. You know, I'll be shocked. I mean, I'll be beyond shocked. You know, if I find when I when we finish tonight, you know, that Biden mentioned this in his State of the Union address. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think so. No, I, 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 I would agree with that. I think, obviously, if you try to enforce a no-fly zone, then you have to deal with the S-400 and S-500 um, air right, defense right. systems that the Russians have, which are very deadly. And you have to fight their planes. And that would probably mean a nuclear war. I, I, I don't think that that is going to, uh, that anybody's going to do that. The Ukrainians um, have uh, jets. They had uh, somewhere around 100 um, jets at the start of this, and they have a lot of uh, the Bakhtiar drones that they bought from uh, Turkey. 
Um, yeah. And yeah. Uh, a lot of those obviously were taken out uh, very early by the Russians. Um, uh, and I, but then they were able to uh, probably hide some jets in bunkered hangars in the West. I mean, I don't, I'm speculating here a little bit. And there were jets flying for another two, three days. I haven't heard much lately about Ukrainian jets. And in fact, they're Pilots are off in Europe trying to get them um, from some of the Eastern European countries. So I imagine those have been destroyed now by the Russians, but they are still flying the, the, the backyard drones, um, which don't require much of a runway so that even if the Russians bomb the airfields, they're able to take those things off and they probably got a lot of those taken out too, but they probably have them in bunkers and they're still flying out and making some attacks, at least around the Kiev area. I'm not sure elsewhere uh, with those. So they have some air power left, but I would imagine not a lot. Yeah, and let me just say one more thing. And that is there seems to be a, a shall we say an, ec there is a movement now afoot. I'm trying to find the right words to explain this or to, to make clear what I'm thinking here. There is a movement of, afoot to supply Ukraine with a lot of defensive weapons, military defensive weapons, okay? Uh, and a lot of this stuff is, is going to Ukraine now. We're getting it in there. Don't ask me how this happens. I mean, where the gateway is, but all of the talk, you know, by CNN News, by MSNBC, you know, about supplying Ukraine with military weapons, defensive weapons, is 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 quite noticeable and quite and I think this what I think this means is that there's a lot of stuff going on that we don't know much about. I think that's really what's happening here, and I don't think we will know much about it for some time yet. Yeah, I would totally agree with Bill. Um, for example, one of the things we just mentioned was talking about these these drones that the Ukrainians are are somehow still using. And I imagine what they're doing, you have to remember, Ukraine is a big place. It's, it's almost the size of Texas. A lot of people think of it as one of these European countries that you can drive across in two or three hours, and it's much larger. Yeah. And, and so probably what's happening is that the U.S. with satellites is looking down and saying, hey, uh, that Su-35 just went back to refuel uh, now get that drone out there, right? Right now, right? And and so they are probably able to use those that way for that reason, because obviously if the drone runs into a Russian jet, the drone's going to lose. Yeah, so, and let me, uh, say, let me say one more thing, Mark. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the size of Ukraine. I thought I, I, I made mention of that the last time uh, I spoke. Ukraine is not only a big country, it is a very rich country agriculturally. It's got a lot of quality. I mean, if you want to be a farmer, if farming turns you on, if this is something you like to do, I've, I've got the place for you, all right? Of course, the war will have to end in the meantime, but I mean, I think I mentioned this the last time. I found myself on a train once going from uh, Kiev to Odessa, and I'm not even sure, I, I can't quite remember why I was on the train, probably, I was going down to Odessa, you know, to try to sell the Fulbright program, which is what I did for three or four years. And I remember standing on the train as we pulled into Odessa that morning, I was standing in one of the cars, we hadn't stopped yet. And this gentleman came along with cowboy boots on and he started looking out the window with me. And he said, look at that land. He said, I can't believe what I'm seeing. I've never seen farmland like this. And I said, well, where are you from? He said, Nebraska. <laughs> so there we go. Um, the next one, Bill, for you is, do you think Putin's recent words and actions concerning nuclear weapons are his version of the madman theory? And we kind of discussed something tangential to this, but this is kind of a different spin on it. Well, I'm not sure. The, what's the bad man theory? Mad, madman theory. Um, so that yeah, I, I'm crazy enough to actually nuke people. This is something that a lot of people thought Richard Nixon did in 1973 with the Yom Kippur War. Well, I, you know, again, I, I really have, I really am starting to believe now because of the universality of this discussion about Putin's mentality. I think this is what we're really talking about now. That here is a man that's doing that's something is wrong with Putin. Something is very wrong with Putin, and it could really have catastrophic effects. In fact, it's even worse than that. It could have apocalyptic effects 
you know, on the country and maybe even the rest of the world. If we don't begin to get our arms, in fact, they even had on, on the TV tonight, and I can't remember who, what the source was, that, that some of our intelligence agencies are now doing real work on this, this, this question or on this problem. In other words, what they're doing, more and more people is taking the question of Putin's mentality to the nth degree. You know, and more and more people are starting to think that here lies the problem. Here is the problem that we're all facing. And until we deal with that issue, Putin's mentality, the war will go one way or the other, but it certainly won't be very good. And I find this very interesting. Who would have guessed eight days ago, nine days ago, that we would be down to talking about Putin's mentality? I don't think so. Everyone seemed to think that Putin was this brilliant kind of, you know, <laughs> I, I'm trying to find the right word here, you know, to describe Putin. Machiavellian. I, Machiavellian. Yeah. yeah. Machiavellian. Perfect. He's no longer, that, that kind of term, terminology is no longer being applied to Putin. Instead, the, what's being applied are terms like insane, sanity, you know, he's off. I noticed just the way he sits, you know, is, is something wrong with him? I noticed, I, I listened to his talk a week ago in which he tried to explain the war to, you know, to the Russian people. He stumbled, you know, he, he had trouble finding any words at all at times. Um, it's, it's really remarkable what we're seeing here. Yeah, and I, I know I, I saw a, a, a tweet from uh, Marco Rubio, actually, that said something mm -hmm. along these lines that said, essentially, if people who are expecting to uh, Putin of today to behave like the Putin of five, uh, five years ago are, are going to be sadly mistaken. So, you know, heck, they may know something that we don't um, uh, on this, but I agree. He even looks physically different. I mean, he's been always this really fit guy, and now he looks kind of puffy and just strange. And I, I don't know what really is going on with him. Uh, and you could, you could argue it's an act, but um, uh, it, it doesn't seem that way to me. I don't think so. And I'm sorry, I didn't really answer the question, you know, very well. I, I really think what, what, I, what I find interesting, and I'll just repeat myself here for a second, is that the groups that are now taking the greatest interest in this particular question of Putin's sanity or Putin's mentality or Putin's stability, the groups that seem to be looking at this with the greatest seriousness are our own intelligence agencies. These are people who do this for a living. You know, in other words, you've got psychologists or psychiatrists running around the West, running around the United States, probably trying to figure out the answer to the question, do we have a madman? on our hands. And what does that mean for the war? What does that mean for the rest of us? This may be the biggest question of all. Uh, another question here, Abil. Um, uh, how long can the Russian economy take a beating uh, due to Western sanctions? Boy, not very long. I mean, they've closed the stock market. Now the Russian stock market hasn't been open for a long, long time. The ruble has, you know, done a nosedive against the dollar. You know, I mean, when you think about it, the Russian economy is almost in a state of utter collapse, you know, and how far this goes or where, where it goes or, or where we wind up in a, in a couple of days. I mean, this is happening very fast, you know, and let's remember the people around Putin are the oligarchs who depend very much on a nice big sum of money, thank you, you know, every once in a while, like several million dollars every once in a while to keep themselves going. So I think the answer to the question is the Russian economy is in deep, in a deep dive. And I'm not sure it's got much, the time is running out on the Russian economy. It sounds terrible to me. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd probably throw in a, a slight bit of difference. He does have uh, obviously huge reserves. Uh, I know the Europeans claim to have frozen some of those. Uh, I'm not an economist, so I, I don't know what that actually would mean. So. There, there may be longer. You also, of course, have to worry about what the Chinese do in the situation, which is obviously- Well, that's another story fact. though, but that's another yeah. issue. Yeah, right. the whole question of China, we haven't touched on that yet. In fact, there's, you know, I mean, that would be a good question for me, you know, or for you or for us, 
you know, what does the impact? In fact, I think the, the whole question of China and Russia now comes into play. I, I, I'm not sure the Chinese have decided how they want to handle this or what they want to do. They seem to be very quiet lately. They haven't said much. You know, they've kept sort of out of the picture. You know, they, they don't want to get caught up in, in some kind of a mess, you know, with Washington at this point. I don't think Putin has any outs as far as China is concerned. In other words, I don't think Putin is going to hop on a plane at some point and step off in Beijing, you know, because the Chinese like him. The Chinese don't want, you know, a, a man like Putin hanging around because he's kind of warped to begin with now. So I, I think that, I really think that the economy, with the possible exception of a few thousand drones, is really in trouble. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I guess I'm a little, little less convinced of that at this point, but I think we'll just kind of have to see, uh, you know, how things play out. Um, I think this could go on longer. Uh, I, I think it could drag for, for some time, um, but it, it, time will tell. Uh, and often sanctions take a while to work. Um, you know, they've had swift on Iran for a very long time, and that obviously hasn't caused the collapse of that regime. So right. I, I'm, I'm always careful about expecting very quick results from, from sanctions. You know, but, 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 but let's remember one thing, Mark, look how fast things have moved, you know, as far as the, as far as the, you know, the, the money, the economy is concerned. I mean, this has been happening very rapidly. What strikes me about the entire war is how fast things are happening, how fast things are changing. And, and one more point, and I should have said this at the very beginning, the thing that, that strikes me the most about from the Ukrainian perspective is the remarkable behavior, the remarkable quality that Zelensky has come to represent, you know, about, you know, about the Ukrainians. You know, he has turned into one of the most incredible people that I've ever ever seen or very heard or ever heard. I mean, he's just think about it for a second. Here's a man who he's 44 years old now. He's got a couple kids. OK. Um, he was a, a TV actor. He was he was a TV actor who used to do some and he was in a play or in I don't know if it was a play or whatever in which he played the part of the Ukrainian president. Then he decided that he, he might as well do the real thing. So he went out and beat the hell out of Poroshenko, who was the previous pre president. And now he steps into office in the middle of a crisis. And what we have now is a crisis that has become the birthplace of Zelensky's heroism. I mean, he really is, people cannot imagine, you know, this happening without the, the um, qualities of the war. But I think it's true that Zelensky has really turned out to be an incredible person, an incredible leader, and someone who will always be remembered, no matter what happens beyond this point. Uh, here, I'm, again, I'm, I've got several different ones here, and we're, we're running a little short on time. Um, will, will the UN remove Russia from membership? Good question. I have no idea. Um, wouldn't surprise me. Nothing would surprise me these days, though. I mean, I'm getting ready to say that in answer to all the questions. In other words, I simply don't know because everything else is off the table. In other words, the things that we thought were impossible to imagine at one point not only become imaginable now, but very imaginable. So if some resolution were to come along to remove Ukraine from the Security Council, of the United Nations, I wouldn't be shocked. I wouldn't be surprised. Okay. Um, how do nuclear protocols uh, in Russia compare to the US? Are there any checks or fail safes on Putin's ability to instigate a nuclear war if he is in fact unhinged? Yeah, good question. I've asked that question a lot in the last few days. You know. I mean, we've done quite a bit of talking tonight about Putin's mentality. And so I have to stop and ask myself, is there anyone else in the Kremlin who might be ready to put a check you know, on this guy and make sure that he doesn't run down the hallway 
you know, and flip the switch before anyone can catch up with him. I, I don't know about that system. It, it simply is beyond me. I know what you're talking about. I'm talking about thinking about the movie Failsafe, you know, where this pilot goes off, you know, and the technology breaks down and they can't get the pilot back who's flying a nuclear bomb into Russia. That, that by the way, that movie, Failsafe, if you ever want to watch a scary movie that is very well done, stars Henry Fonda, you know, in the movie Failsafe, then watch it. It's highly recommended. Okay, Bill, I am going to, since we're, we're coming toward the end here, it's 7.52, um, I wanted to kind of turn it over to you to, to wrap up and see uh, um, in closing what you thought. And obviously neither one of us feel like making predictions because this thing is so fast moving and so fluid and could go in so many different directions. Um, but uh, closing remarks, uh, what would you have for us tonight? Okay, well, listen, thank you for coming tonight. And Mark, I appreciate your, your insight and your, your help along the way. Um, I think we're looking at something in history that doesn't happen very often. And that is that there is a real movement afoot now to try to make life better for a large nation of people. They are tough, they are strong, they are not afraid you know, of the future. They, I think, can help us get through together. You know, I, I think the Ukrainians you know, are, are worth watching. Uh, I think they are good people by and large, you know, and I think they have something to teach us. But most importantly, and let me end on this, most importantly, Ukrainians are teaching us the importance, the value of freedom the value of living in a good country, the importance of living in a good country. And that I think is what needs to be remembered here. Ukraine is a country that came along in the collapse of the Soviet Union, you know, and look where they are 30 years later. It's remarkable. Thank you, Bill and Mark for another wonderful evening. I already have people asking, will there be a number three? And um, we will see. We hope to be able to give it more time uh, for people to catch up to the news and, and uh, possibly post something later this week about something coming next week. So people can make some plans around joining uh, the event. Um, Mark, thank you so much for your expertise and your knowledge on the area and uh, the work you do for our students here at Doan. Um, obviously, a teacher that wins Professor of the Year three times uh, has to be has, has to know his business, and, and you've demonstrated that this evening. And Bill, again, thank you for your expertise. You have a lot of your former students and, and uh, colleagues who have joined us tonight, and we've had a wonderful evening. I want to... Um, Thank everybody who's joined us and, and thank both of you for your time this evening and give people plenty of time to go uh, catch uh, President Biden's speech. It's coming on here in just a few minutes. So uh, thank you, Michael and the alumni office for setting this up. Bill and Mark, thanks again. And to all of you who've joined, thank you for uh, joining us for another edition of uh, the Ukrainian crisis and I think I'm hopeful that we'll see uh, clearer minds take over from here soon. So thank you thank all, you. and I bid you all farewell. Uh, thank you again, Bill. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Marty. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Hey, thank you, Mark. <laughs>